So how long exactly have you been politically active? So, um, active, uh, I would say, um, I guess it depends what you mean active, but, but, um, as far as, yeah, you know, running for office, no, this, this is it. Um, as a, uh, journalist, I, um, you know, you, you, you try to be impartial, you try to be objective, and, um, and, and so I was uh, never going to be in, involved in that when I was a journalist. Um, but I, I've always been very, uh, I guess, uh, very interested. So even going back to when I was a kid, I was like the weird kid who, who paid attention, followed politics, and, um, and, and, you know, my parents, I, I guess, kind of encouraged that because uh, they saw the, you know, the educational value of, of, of that, being aware of, of what was going on. And, um, you know, I, ever since then. So when, when I, I went to college, I, I was trying to figure out what I was uh, wanting to study. And um, I, I was always interested in politics. And so journalism kind of was a natural fit to uh, jump into that. Fair enough. Just kind of get a feel for like where your political beliefs stand. Would you be willing to disclose who you voted for in either the primaries and or the general in 2016? Um, sure, sure. So um, I, I'm, uh, I am, uh, I'm an independent. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I didn't participate in any sort of primary. Um, or, or at least for the for the presidential election, of course. Um, during the general election, I voted for uh, Gary Johnson, the, the Libertarian candidate. Not um, and and again, we we had a um, we had a a, <laughs> a choice of candidates that was far from ideal, and um, uh, you know both both the the two major party candidates had some significant flaws to them, and I, I felt like I wasn't in a position where I w was going to get behind either of them. So, um, so it, it was kind of then deciding where I wanted to put my vote. And um, I, d I don't agree with uh, all of the positions uh, of Gary Johnson. He certainly didn't acquit himself very well and during parts of the campaign. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, he, his track record when he was the governor of New Mexico was, was uh, actually very highly regarded. I, I remember um, paying attention to him then, you know, he was known for uh, using the line item veto pretty much more than anybody else uh, in, in the country, I, I think. He, and um, so the, the state at that time was fairly fiscally responsible. Um, and the, but, but really, uh, one of the things that I look for more than anything else, you guys probably saw it on my website, uh, with, with some of the things I talked about. And if, uh, I know you've been following me on Twitter, but I, I talk, I talk about the word integrity a lot. And, uh, more than anything, I, I think when I choose who to vote for, that's what I look for. And, um, and, and so, you know. Whether or not Gary Johnson, you know, had the most integrity of anybody else, I, I think in hindsight, at least among the, you know, the top four candidates, uh, that would be uh, an easy argument to make, um, you know, given some of the things that have come out about Jill Stein since then. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, that's the reason, that's a big part of why I'm running for Congress here. I, I don't think... Ken Calvert has any integrity. I've never voted for him um, in all the years I've lived in California. I, I can't see that ever changing because um, because it's you know it's kind of either something you do have or don't have. I mean, I voted for all kinds of people um, for president in the past. Um, I voted for Republicans, um, you know, independents. Uh, I think I've, I think I even voted for Obama one of the one of the elections. Um, voted for Ralph Nader. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it's an open book to me, you know, yeah, and, and it's, I'm more concerned about people who are true to their word and, uh, or at least do their very best to be true to their word. Okay. So you're worried more about politicians individually and on the issues rather than party. Right. Which, which is completely obvious, you know, from, right. from what I'm doing so far with my campaign. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, there's a hashtag people are using that I'm using to country over party because I, I don't like seeing the politicians just sell people out, um, sell their country out just to do what their party says. And, um, you know, uh, in recent weeks with the, the health care debate, that, that has applied a lot to Republicans, but Democrats do it on, on plenty of other issues. So, um, uh, yeah, definitely I'm, I'm about people uh, versus the party. I'm, uh, you know, I think just as being an independent, um, you're, you're, not, uh, you're not part of one side or the other. You don't have that sort of rooting interest. And, um, and uh, you know, so I think we're all obviously Americans first. Uh, we all are patriotic to some extent. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe that one side or the other has uh, a monopoly on patriotism um, or loving this country. And, and when, when one side claims to or, and, and says the other side doesn't, it, it really turns me off. I can get behind that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you decide to run for Congress? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, as a journalist, I'd never really been interested in running for office. Um, and, and then uh, it, it was this last year, the election, how di divisive it was and uh, how nasty it was. Uh, it, it really, you know, I think I wasn't different than most people in, in being pretty uh, disgusted by it. And, uh, you know, I, and I'm, I'm certainly no, uh, no new newcomer to watching elections and watching how nasty they get. But, but even so, I, I mean, I'm a lot older than you guys. And so I, I've seen this going back a, a lot, lot more uh, cycles than you, but, um, it, uh, it, it definitely was the worst and unlike anything else we've seen. Um, and, and so that, that just really uh, put me off. And, um, but then this year, the, really the, the tipping point, because even then I, I wasn't deciding, well, maybe, maybe I'll do something about it. It, it was uh, the healthcare debate. Um, you know, Obamacare, I, I talk about healthcare a lot and both out uh, campaigning talking to people and, and on my website and, and social media. And, and so Obamacare has, has had its big problems. Um, I think overall, Obamacare is a big step forward for the country. Um, you know, we got rid of, um, you know, uh, we, the uh, lifetime uh, caps on insurance plans. Um, there was the uh, protections for people with pre-existing conditions, um, you know, the, the provision letting kids stay on their parents' health care until age 26. So, so there are definitely some, some major benefits. Um, the fact that all, so many more people have health insurance than did before, um, you know, I, I do think that Ideally, we, we want to get to a point as a country where everybody has health insurance. Now, you know, how we get there is, is obviously a, a tricky thing. But so, so I saw Obamacare as um, a, a, a big step forward. And it was something that we needed to go back and continue to, to improve and uh, address the shortcomings. And, and then when the... Um, uh, the Republicans started out this uh, session of Congress and, uh, you know, in March when the, the House first took up uh, their, their plan, the AHCA, it was, uh, you know, I, I just was shocked, I guess, um, that the lack of 
of good ideas that they were putting out there. Uh, it, it was there was no way that you could sell this as as, as an improvement, and you know they they were essentially wanting to take away cancel out, repeal the, the best parts of Obamacare, and then... I'm surprised you would be shocked they had that idea. Well, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> no, not shocked, but the extent of it, and, uh, and, the, and be because, um, you know, the, especially given some of the, the promises that were made during the campaign, as, you know, particularly by the president, but... Um, you know, uh, and and then they completely uh, went against that, and um, and and so it, it, there really was a big sense of outrage that I had personally over that. Uh, it, it was not hard for me to uh, understand and envision how millions and millions of people across our country, and and you know tens of thousands, if not more, in our own district would be hurt by. Um, by the uh, AHCA or, or then the Senate versions, uh, you know, that were, were to come after that. But really it was in, in March after the, the House uh, first um, voted on and, and first failed and then secondly approved it, um, their plan that, 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 that I kind of made up my mind to do this. So when you, you were looking at your options of how you wanted to go in and enact this change, you decided on Congress, why not something smaller, like local or state office? Yeah, because um, a couple of reasons. First, this is happening at, at the, the federal level, and, and, um, and I wanted to, uh, you know, contribute to the, to the discussion there. Um, and then secondly, uh, it, it goes back to what I was saying before about integrity, you know, and Ken Calvert, you know, this guy has been in office for 25 years, uh, and it would be, uh, I think disingenuous for anyone to argue that he is, is, uh, you know, the, the model type of, uh, representative that we need in our countries uh, and or, or I mean really it's the farthest thing from that he, he's a poster boy for for everything that you don't want your elected officials to to be so um, he, you know as I mentioned I've, I've never voted for him and uh, and I, I felt like our district needed better um, and uh, I've, I haven't been particularly impressed by um, the other candidates who've run against him in the past, um, uh, and uh, with you know the exception of uh, uh, I would say Bill Hedrick back in uh, 08 and, and 2010, he he obviously uh, came the closest to unseating Calvert, but um, I, I think he also ran. Uh, you know, a better campaign focused on, on issues that mattered to people. And, and the last few cycles, uh, I don't feel like the, the opposing candidates have done that. Um, and, and to me, with, with health care being the issue that it is, um, you know, I know that that affects people just from even before I started running, people I talked to, um, you know, friends, um, acquaintances. I mean, that, that's something near and dear to people, something that a lot of people worry about. And, um, and, and I, I thought that that would be an, an issue I could um, help bring about something uh, more positive. So, um, I don't know. I, I think I got off topic <laughs> at some point. Um, but, but it's all interconnected anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really seemed like you just... You just know the issues that are very important to you, and they were they were currently being discussed on a federal well, level. Well, so that that issue in in particular was was extremely timely. But uh, I mean, there there's many other issues that uh, you know I'm not going to only run about one issue. Yeah. But right now, that's the one that is is uh, front and center, and, and I'm spending most of my time talking about it. 
So you, you kind of alluded to it before, but I was wondering why you why you decided to run as independent instead of a third party. I mean, it sounds like you just don't want to. You just don't feel like you align solidly with any of the four major parties. So. Right, and uh, well, uh, I mean, there there's um, yeah, there's a couple things to it. One, I've always been independent. I've never been registered with any party. Um, you know, when I was 18 and signed up to vote, I signed up as an independent. And then, um, you know, when I've had other times to re-register, moving from one state to another, uh, there was that uh, opportunity. But, you know, personally, I, I don't believe in that. I, I, for as long as I can remember, it's what I've been saying. I see the parties and, and uh, what they seem to care about is themselves and the, the two-party system um, <laughs> I think is particularly unbeneficial to our country um, you know why why was it that uh, Gary Johnson or Jill Stein couldn't have um, you know had more exposure and had a, an opportunity to debate the issues with the other two candidates well, it's because, you know, the rules that generally uh, exist in our country are meant to preserve the two-party system because they've been enacted by Democrats and Republicans. I, I mean, they're both on each other's side more than they're uh, against each other. Um, you know, they both want to maintain their power, their control uh, at the expense of anybody else, whether it's uh, citizens and their rights and their right to, to vote and have free choices, free elections, um, and, uh, you know, and, and obviously we have free elections, but I mean um, open and, and completely yeah. fair and without, you know, uh, impediments to people, uh, you know, registering and, and voting. Uh, so, you know, there's that, and then uh, particularly when it comes to the, the third parties, um, yeah, there's been so few candidates elected um, in recent times with uh, a third party or even as an independent. Um, you know, the, la the last uh, new person elected to the House as an independent was Bernie Sanders, which was 25 years ago. He's obviously in the Senate now, but when he was elected to the House as an independent, uh, you know, that was how he, he started out before going to the Senate. And then, uh, you know, before that, it, it's been even longer. So, um, you know, so I align with, uh, you know, I, I don't say align because independents can be all over the place. There's a lot of independents who are, you know, very much Republican in their thinking, conservative, very, and then there's independents on the other side, and then there's, um, you know, the some who are all over the place. Um, or, uh, But I think generally independents tend to be more moderate, more centrist, even if they do lean one way or the other, they're, they're open-minded. I mean, I mean I've, I've talked to, um, you know, one of the things about being an independent, when I tell people I'm an independent, uh, you know, usually the reaction I get is, well, at least you're not a Democrat, or at least you're not a Republican. <laughs> and, and so I find that people are willing to listen to me on both sides um, and, and give me uh, an opening uh, to, to you know, for them to hear where where I'm coming from, uh, that uh, wouldn't exist. It really it, makes it really makes people take you by an issue by issue basis instead of just assuming what you stand for. Well, that's what I'm I'm hoping. I mean, we'll <laughs> we'll see how it how it turns out. You know, there's a long way to go, but but yeah, there it's definitely been a thing where people are are willing to listen at least, um, and and so and 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 with. The, the laws here in California uh, with our top two primary um, system, that, that does open up opportunities for independence that don't exist anywhere else, uh, or at least in other uh, states that have different laws. Or, or same with third parties. I mean, presumably, um, you, you know, a, a, a green or libertarian um, could could find their way to uh, making it to the, the general election. And, and uh, actually last year in, in the cycle, we had two independents that did exactly what I'm trying to do, where they won 
uh, you know, came in second place in their uh, primary election and went to the general against the incumbent. And they lost, but, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I'll have an opportunity to, uh, to do that and, and uh, have a different outcome. Hopefully the, the tribal wars that we're having, red versus blue, doesn't get in the way of well, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be something I'm I'm gonna have to work extremely hard to to overcome. Uh, I'm confident I'm going to win votes from Republicans and Democrats and uh, and certainly Independents. But um, you know, it's not going to be easy because I'm gonna have to uh, you know make that argument that put your your um, quote, team aside and vote for the person uh, who can best represent uh, this district. So on your website, you, you mention how you want workers to be respected in the workplace. Um, did you have any legislation in mind, anything that's already been proposed that you would like to, to see hit the floor again or anything new that you think you have to bring? Yeah, um, I, I think there's always uh, an opportunity to, to stand up and get on board with um, legislation that, that other people are uh, proposing. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned to you guys uh, before we started, uh, I've run a small business and, and, um, and uh, you know, I think I mentioned it on my website. You know, when when you're building a team and you're um, leading a team, it, it's it, there's really no substitute for the people who are on your team, and uh, and those are, you know, the the workers. And I mean, that it sounds weird to say that there, you know, with that that term, but uh, that you know, that was sort of the question. Um, and and I also don't just look at you know workers as just the, the you know, the guys on the front line, um, you know, I mentioned that people who run small businesses to me are, are working people, um, you, you know, even professionals, white collar people uh, are, are working people. Um, you know, if you've got to go out there and bust your butt and uh, um, get a paycheck to pay your bills and, and take care of your family, to me, you're, you're a working person. And, um, and so it's a, it's a pretty broad definition. Uh, I mean the the elites, the the you know the very wealthy, the the one percent. Okay, whatever they can they can do whatever they're doing. Um, nobody's going to uh, be able to, to uh, label them working people in that regard. But um, uh, so uh, as far as specific things, uh, you know, as I said, there 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 will be uh, ideas that come up. Um, I, I do think we have a, a balance that in, in our country, um, even uh, where, where workers uh, are, are sort of forced to uh, take it or leave it. And, um, and, and sure, I believe in, in people having choices. If you don't like a job, find another job. Um, same thing, you know, I believe, uh, it, it's a free country. Uh, businesses and employees should be able to choose and you know um, what what's best for each other um, or for themselves I should say uh, however but uh, what you don't what a lot of people don't understand is that the laws behind the scenes um, affect that interaction so like one one idea I do support is that um, uh, businesses uh, would not and should not be able to ask people um, on, a, on a job application or uh, interview uh, how much money they currently make um, so that uh, because what that does is it is it takes it from being an, an open negotiation it takes it away from being uh, market value for people's uh, work and, and then the value is set on what somebody was making at their, their current job or their previous job. 
Um, and uh, you, you know, you guys may have run into this in, in your careers, but if, if you apply for a job and, and somebody knows you were making $20 an hour at, at your last job, uh, you know, even if you get a job that typically pays $30 an hour, they're, they're not going to offer you $30 an hour, they'll offer you $22 or, or something like that. Um, so, you know, I believe in the free market and the free market has to go both ways. It has to be free. So, um, you know, so that's one thing. And, th and there's been legislation proposed uh, in Congress. Um, I, I can't, it's escaping me who uh, uh, the name of the uh, representative who's proposed that, but it's been um, shot down. Um, typically, uh, Republicans uh, are opposed to that provision and, and uh, a lot of Democrats are for it. But, um, you know, it may not be just that simple. Um, but, but that's the kind of thing that, that I support. What about a $15 minimum wage federally? Well, I, I, I'm not willing to put a number on a federal minimum wage. Uh, I think that our current federal minimum wage hasn't been changed in years. Um, I, d I do uh, fully support adjusting um, or, or linking the federal minimum wage to some sort of a um, you know cost of living adjustment, um, and and I think states and uh, localities should be free to set the the you know minimum wage to uh, whatever they see uh, as uh, you know right for them. I mean, obviously here in California, our minimum wage uh, what currently ten fifty an hour, I think. Depends and, on business size. For fifty or less employees, it's ten. For more than fifty, it's ten fifty. Yeah, and and um, you know, the, there's other other um, adjustments. I think already approved. Some cities are uh, are you know have higher uh, or are in the in the process of raising that. Um, uh, like LA, right? They're, they're they're on the way to fifteen. I think a little bit every year. Um, Seattle has had a $15 minimum wage. So if, if local areas uh, think that that's the right move, great. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I think, I think uh, you know, it, whether the minimum wage in, you know, the federal minimum wage, I mean, it, it's embarrassingly low. Um, are there many people that actually work at that? I, I, I'd have to look at the, the numbers, I'm sure in some areas, some states there might be, but then again, in, in other states, um, you know, essentially you have a higher um, uh, floor because it, it's, it's just so unrealistic. I, I can say that here in California, even, even when the minimum wage was lower than it is now, and, you know, businesses that I work for, um, entry level positions, uh, usually paid above the minimum wage to people. Um, you know, I mentioned how I worked in restaurants and, uh, you know, managed restaurants, uh, led those, uh, type of businesses. It, it was pretty common that even the dishwashers, uh, would not be paid right at minimum wage. Sometimes, yes, if, maybe if they had no experience, but if somebody was experienced, uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon to even start somebody off, uh, you know, an hour, a dollar an hour above minimum wage or whatever. So I've got a friend that's been in the same line of business for like four or five years now. He's still making minimum. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but, um, you know, it, it depends, um, it depends on the business, the, on the industry and then, and the employer too. What would you think of, in place of minimum wage, a federal mandate to require regions to tie their their local minimum wage to a living wage? Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I, I I'm not necessarily for a lot of federal mandates. Um, I do think the federal minimum wage should be higher than where it is, and uh, you know, I I don't know. 
I don't have a number in mind that I, that I you know, uh, would just come right out and say. I, I think uh, anybody who who does that, who's not been intimately involved with the issue, is probably just pulling up a number, um, you know, for the sake of uh, sounding, uh, you know, making a statement that they think people will uh, support. Um, but but again, I, I, I'm fully behind the idea of any state, any city, any county that wants a higher minimum wage to, to set that. Um, there's a case recently that uh, where the opposite happened. So um, in, in St. Louis. So St. Louis has a higher minimum wage than um, the state of Missouri uh, and, and uh, the federal minimum wage. And then what happened recently, um, the, the state of Missouri then passed a law that was forbidding cities from having a higher minimum wage than, than the state. And uh, so, it, you know, so that was kind of an end around of the system and, and, it, and it's, it was bogus. Um, and, and uh, it, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know uh, the, you know, who proposed it and who voted for that, uh, you know, uh, but I, I'm sure the business community was in favor of that and probably got the Republicans uh, to back the measure. But again, um, I, I, I believe state and local governments should have more autonomy to, to do, um, you know, things like that or, or really on any number of, of issues as, as long as it uh, is consistent with, uh, um, you know, our constitution and minimum wage is not <laughs> relevant to our constitution. So. so Back on to healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, the Republicans have been coming back again and again and again and again. Yeah. <laughs> um, ever since it got to the Senate, they've been trying to go through these different procedures. And I've only been involved in politics for just this year. Mm -hmm. so. I only know what I've read in, in government books and seen what votes have, have done in the past, mm -hmm. but everything I'm hearing from everybody else reporting on it is this doesn't happen. So McCain called for regular order, turned around, made a vote outside of regular mm -hmm. order. but. What do you think about all of these different procedures that are apparently technically possible in Congress, but seem to be able to circumvent what everybody thought was the normal order of things for yeah. how a bill is passed? Right, right. And, and it, it happens on all kinds of things. It, um, it, and it's, <laughs> it's unfortunate. Uh, it's not what... Um, not what our democracy is supposed to be about. Um, you know, uh, things should be conducted out in the open. They should be, uh, you know, we have rules they are supposed to be followed. And, and essentially what Congress has done, um, and, and it's nothing new, it's go it, it goes back, um, years and and it, both sides are guilty of it uh, as they have they have rules you know regular order and then they have um exceptions to the rules and they have uh other rules that let them get around the rules and um and so it's it's because the the, the senate sets their own rules i mean it's sort of like the um the nomination of, uh, of uh, Justice Gorsuch earlier this year. So, you know, everybody talks about, talked about the, um, the uh, filibuster and you, you know, you have to have 60, 60 votes to um, stop a filibuster and to advance the nomination. Uh, well, 
they had a way around it, and uh, and it was something that had happened in the past, uh, just in recent years. And so, you know, the Republicans did that, and they said, "Well, you guys did it too," which was absolutely true. It still doesn't make it right, or it doesn't make you know the kind of government that uh, you know we. The people um, are entitled to, and and that uh, you know that that we were given by uh, by our constitution. So um, I want to see that uh, that Congress, both you know the House and the Senate, uh, try to reform their their rules and 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 uh, have a better process where bills are discussed. Gus disgusted, disgust, <laughs> wow, out in the open. And, um, you know, amendments can be offered and voted on. Um, it's not just a matter of the party leaders deciding um, who, uh, who gets to have a hearing for their, um, for their bill or their amendment. I mean, I mean, basically, the way it is now, if you have a bill and they don't want that to get out of uh, and get a vote, they'll just keep it in the committee. It won't get out of the committee. The committee won't bother to even hear it. It'll just kind of sit there um, on the on the on the schedule. Um, and and uh, you know, if it's one thing if the committee hears it and votes it down, okay, that's part of how the process is supposed to work. But um, you know, what what I think a lot of people haven't realized, and unless they've been paying attention to some of these more high-profile things, is that um, that yeah, the, our system doesn't uh, you know it doesn't work like uh, Schoolhouse Rock tells you it does. Um, it, it's it's uh, there's there's all kinds of uh, maneuvering and um, things that happen in secret. Uh, you know, like last night we had the the skinny repeal that the Republicans were voting on, and uh, nobody knew what it was. Uh, and, and then they released the, uh, the text of it uh, at, uh, you know, like, uh, what, 8 o'clock our time, something like that. Yeah, uh, I was you know. getting headlines for it on my phone yeah. while I was at work. And I work nights. Yeah, so it I'm was, not it was to like get political updates in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and obviously they they had a very long session uh, of Congress uh, of, in the Senate last night to consider all these amendments and and have their vote, but to keep the main thing secret and until two hours before, and then you know have two hours of debate about a bill that. Is going to reshape um, healthcare in this country, which is you know close to twenty percent of our economy. Uh, I, I mean, nobody could 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 make an argument that that makes a lot of sense, um, you know. And and so uh, you know, it, it was just a, a bad night uh, for democracy in that regard. The, the fact that the the repealed lost man yeah, was was definitely a good thing for our country. So um, the three uh, Republican senators who uh, broke with their party and and voted for something that uh, was in the nation's best interest, you know, more power to them. Uh, they, they did the right thing. Yeah, I'm glad that that one failed, but it. It is pretty scary to look at what is possible. I've looked at the text of some of these healthcare bills, and they're, I think one of them was 160 pages long. So to introduce a bill like that and only allow two hours of debate, nobody can even read the bill in that amount of time right. before the vote. Right. So that, that just makes passing what you think you're passing absolutely impossible. Right, and and you know the um, you know at least back in March when the House voted on the on the AHCA, um, you know there was enough time um, for people to read it. I know of of at least you know some of the uh, congressmen who did read the bill from start to finish. I mean there are some 
who, who take their responsibility to the country and to the Constitution and to, you know, the original principles of our democracy very seriously. And then there are many people who didn't, you know, who didn't read it. And, and that bill was hundreds and hundreds of pages. And, and so you can kind of understand that maybe that, you know, that can put, um, put a strain on, on somebody to, to try to read through that. But yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I give full credit to, to, um, our representatives who, who put in that kind of time and effort and work to, to make an informed decision. And, and if you've read any of the bills, you know how dry and difficult and, and it, you know, hard to make sense of some of the things uh, in there, how, you know, just how hard that is. And, and so, you know, to read through that and, um, you know, find the things that are actually relevant uh, can be difficult. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's the kind of thing I want to see from all of our elected officials. I, I mean, that's the kind of of uh, congressmen I want to be, you know, the kind who does read through all the bills the, and the, the kind who will stand up and say, why aren't we debating this? Or, you know, why is this being written in secret? Or, uh, you know, the other thing <laughs> I don't think most people understand is that the uh, vast majority of all legislation in our country in our state, in our country, um, you know, really at most um, of the higher levels of government are, are not actually written in, you know, the offices of our elected officials. A lot of times it's um, interest groups, um, lobbyists who write these laws, and then they shop them around, try to find uh, somebody to sign on to the bill. Um, so, I, I mean, is it any surprise that, that um, you know, we have, uh, you know, such a, a corrupt system where, where, you know, lawmakers get, uh, you know, their, their campaigns paid for by special interests and, um, and that bills will favor one, one side or the, you know, uh, one special interest or another, or, you know, sometimes there's even very specific, um, provisions that, uh, benefit, you know, one company or a couple specific companies and uh you know even if they're not named by name you know the the uh, specific descriptions will make it uh, clear exactly what's going on so that that's bad government and uh and and uh you know that's the other thing i i do talk about a lot on on my website are uh, is having this uh you know wall between um special interests and the government the the lobbyists um, and, and, uh, you know, that's something that the people in our system, um, if they don't want it to happen, if, if they want to stand up for good governance, if Ken Calvert wants to, um, if Paul Ryan wants to, if, if, uh, Kevin McCarthy, you know, uh, the, those are the, the, uh, the, you know, not Ken Calvert, but the other two are the, the top Republican leaders. Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, you know, if these, these people want to stand up for good governance, they can do so at any time, but they don't because they're, they're all, um, invested in the system. Uh, they're all getting money from the same sources and, uh, and, and it's, it's not what democracy is supposed to be. And Nancy Pelosi actually just said when she was the target of being ousted from leadership and said, you can't get rid of me. I'm your best fundraiser. <laughs> right. And, 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 and it's true, but I mean, is, is that what it's all about? I, and, and unfortunately, uh, it, it is if everybody agrees that that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with that. So, um, you know, again, that's part of me standing up for, you know, I, not just working people, but for all the people uh, and and for democracy and, and good governance. Uh, so we just touched on it briefly, but money in politics sounds like obviously you want it out. 
Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, mo money is always going to have a place in politics, but there's good money, there's transparent money, um, and, and, um, and, and that's what, you know, that's what true democracy is, is about. So, yeah, I support all the, any sort of uh, provisions, uh, uh, legislation to, for transparency. There, there's a bill in, in, uh, in uh, the, the assembly right now, I think it's called the Disclose Act, uh, relating to um, ballot propositions and um, other type of uh, PAC campaigns, um, things like that, that would require those to uh, very clearly state where their money is coming from on, on advertisements. And, and that's something I'm completely behind. Um, uh, you know, dark money needs to, to go away. And, you know, we need to shine a light on that and, uh, and uh, you know, have a light on, on all the money in, in our political system. And, um, you know, talking, as you mentioned, Nancy Pelosi, uh, and this will be something I'll be highlighting throughout the, the campaign. Uh, I, I mean, I mentioned how both sides get their money from the same places. It's mm -hmm. completely true. Uh, Ken Calvert and Nancy Pelosi both got large uh, campaign donations from AT&T uh, last uh, cycle. And, uh, you know, I could list more and more, um, you know, uh, some of the different Indian tribes both give to, to uh, Calvert and Pelosi. So, um, you know, it, it, who knows? I, I may, uh, that may be part of my uh, way to get through to some of the Republican voters is, you know, show how uh, Ken Calvert and Nancy Pelosi are very much alike in, in uh, some regards. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty strange how how much they have in common, even though they're always at each other's throats. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, you know, and unfortunately, as an independent, that it hurts my ability to raise money, you know, because if, if you're on one team or the other, you can go out there and, and you know, say, rah, rah, give me money, I'm on your side, and people, people will believe that. People will take that. For me, it's a harder case to make, but, you know, I've, I've, been getting some donations so far, and uh, as my campaign continues to gain momentum, that's just going to build, and, and uh, I, I'm confident I'm going to end up with enough money to uh, make a credible uh, case for myself, and uh, and uh, you know make a, the, the case to, to the voters of the this district. Yeah, I, I agree with you on uh, shining a light on all the money that is going into politics, but would you be able to support getting money completely out of politics yeah. and going with public funding? I, I think public funding makes a lot of sense. I, 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 I There are states where they have public funding and 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 I be, I would love to see it here in California. Um, I, you know, it's something that the two parties always fight against and um, because they know it's in their interest to have an uneven playing field where they're the only ones getting the money because, uh, you know, the other can candidates, uh, you know, whether they're independents like me or minor, uh, you know, third party candidates, uh, libertarians, greens, um, you know, those being the main ones here, but uh, other states have, have their, uh, you know, their other, uh, minor parties. Minnesota has one called, uh, I think like the Workers and Farmers Party, uh, which is kind of the, the 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 main third party, I think, in in Minnesota at least for state elections. Um, so um, yeah, but there are states where they have public funding. I think Maine's one of them. It's also no surprise that Maine has uh, more independence um, than other states. I mean, they have a U.S. senator who's independent. They have a, a uh, they've had governors, uh, I, and I think their current governor, I, I can't remember if he's an independent or a Republican, but um, they, uh, they have, they've had, um, uh, 
you know, a lot of uh, state representatives who are independent. So there are uh, reforms and changes that can happen that can make our election um, uh, freer, make a more level playing field. And I'm, I'm all behind those because, uh, it, it, again, it shouldn't be this duopoly where two, two sides are, are keeping control for themselves. Um, another option, um, you know, might be uh, nonpartisan uh, races. You know, that I, I can't see that happening on the federal level because the parties will never let it happen. But there are some states where um, they're nonpartisan, where if, if you're whatever your party is, you, it's not going to appear on the ballot. And, uh, and you may even not even be allowed to advertise. Um, so, you know, there are things that can be done. I, like, for example, in my, the state I grew up in, which is Nebraska, uh, there, they, Nebraska is unique. They have a one, uh, house, uh, for the state government, uh, unicameral, they call it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, um, but the, the senators in, in Nebraska are all elected on a nonpartisan basis. So even though they, they may be, they may belong to one party or another, again, it doesn't appear on the ballot. At least that's how it used to be. I'm, I can't say for certain that it's still the case, but I, I, my understanding is that, that it is. Yeah, that would, that would be great. To yeah, I, I mean, I, those from the ballots. anything that, you know, can level the playing field, make it about the candidates, the, the policies, as opposed to the party, um, you know, be, because what does the party tell you? It, it, it tells you that somebody, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of lazy to me, to me. Um, it, it takes the burden off of a lot of our voters from finding out what somebody suggests or uh, supports uh, what they stand for. And, and I think that's true here in our district with Ken Calvert. I, th um, I think if a lot of the Republicans knew what he was about and uh, they, they wouldn't support him. Um, you know, there are people I've talked to who, who are unaware, you know, regardless of if they were Republicans or Democrats or independents, who are unaware of, of any of his, you know, personal or, um, you know, uh, office related uh, scandals or ethical shortcomings uh, and be, you know, and, and part of that is, again, I'll put, go back to candidates who've run against him who maybe haven't uh, been very effective candidates in, in pointing some of these things out. Did you have something? No, nothing on this subject, but uh, I do have a couple more questions. Uh, I feel like we keep coming back to healthcare, but it seems to be your, your favorite sure. issue, so may as well. Uh, you, you've mentioned that uh, you at some point wanted everyone to be covered, but did you have any specific policy ideas? Yeah, I mean, uh, no, no, I don't know how we get there. I, uh, I, you know, in California, people talk about single payer a lot. That was in the news. Um, <clears throat> And, and the plan that went forward here really was, um, you know, a joke in, in my view. Um, it, it was just kind of a broad outline of, of you know, we'll, we'll have single payer, everybody will be covered. And, um, and, and so, you know, what happened was, uh, again, it was written by a, a special interest group. The, the California Nurses Association, which you know, I'm uh, I'm all for nurses, but um, should our nurses be writing our legislation? Uh, you know, I don't think they or any other group should should be. Um, I, I think uh, you know everybody should be allowed to give input on on uh, any of our laws. You know, that's why we have public hearings for uh, legislation, but. Um, so this law, this uh, pr uh, proposal was lit written by a special interest group. Uh, again, they found somebody to sign on to it. And then even though it didn't have any uh, really details to it, the California Senate approved it um, with the idea that the House or the Assembly, I, should, <laughs> I, I need to say, the Assembly would 
um, flesh out the details. And, and so it was a way that the, the California Senate um, could, could score some PR points with, uh, you know, the groups that are sympathetic toward um, single payer without actually having to uh, do any of the work. So they passed it on to the assembly. And then when the assembly shelved it, um, you know, the speaker De Leon got a lot of blowback for, for that decision. But the fact is it, it wasn't ready. And, uh, you know, the initial estimates of the cost of single payer for California was somewhere around $400 billion a year, which compared to our current state um, budget, it, our current state budget is anywhere, depending on which numbers you use, anywhere from like 130 to 180 billion. So this was two to three times our entire state budget. And I mean, you know, to, to throw something out there like that is, is a huge undertaking and, and uh, you know, it would need a lot of time and a lot of work. So I, I did not support the, the single payer option that was proposed. If, if somebody came up with a good plan, um, I'd be willing to look at it. Um, I, I do think so far the best um, system we have that comes the closest to universal coverage is in Massachusetts. Um, you know, so Romney Care, as, as they called it when it was first uh, uh, put out there, Mitt Romney was the governor when, when they approved that. And um, it, of course, was the, the model for Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that was one of these things where it wasn't perfect. They've gone back, they've had to adjust, they've had to make um, changes. And, but, um, you know, my understanding is that they are essentially at universal coverage, um, something like 98 to 99%. Um, and, and so, yes, it's something we can do and we can get there. Uh, it's not gonna happen overnight, especially you know, with, with the deep divisions we have um, right now. Um, but I, I think, you know, uh, if enough people stand up for uh, what's right and stand up for, uh, you know, government with integrity, then, uh, you know, then, you know, the big things will work themselves out, whether it's on healthcare or other issues. And then, you know, if we ha unite in a common purpose, you know, our common ideals uh, and, and uh, you know, then, then we just have to figure out some of the little details. But, you know, it goes back to what I said, we're, we're all Americans, we're all, you know, uh, uh, hopefully all um, people who love this country deeply. And, uh, and, and I have no doubt that at least in our government, you know, on both sides, you know, that everybody does. And uh, so I wanna see our elected officials, you know, focus on that rather than their, their own brand of politics or, or their party. And, uh, and that's, that's what I'm gonna do uh, when I'm elected. All right, did you have anything else? Or should I ask my last question? Go for it. All right, so this one's totally unrelated to anything mm -hmm. else. But uh, we were we were looking at your website earlier, and the only section there that really made me raise an eyebrow was the environment stuff. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to read down. I'm sure. just going to read verbatim what I wrote down here. Why don't you believe that it's important to recognize the climate change, that climate change is heavily influenced by humanity? Isn't it important to acknowledge the causes so we can work to lessen them? Mm -hmm. I, I do believe climate change is... Uh, influenced by humanity. I, I think we contribute to that. Um, I, I think what I try to get to at my web, on my website and, uh, and uh, you know, that's, that's good feedback. Maybe I need to uh, take a look at the wording there. And, uh, but... Um, yeah, the way it was phrased was basic, basically, do I think that uh, humans are responsible for climate change? Doesn't really matter. Yeah. We should be trying to. Well, I do. <laughs> I, I, I'm saying, for the purpose of our of our um, discussion for the in politics, I, I don't think it does matter whether we are, whether we aren't, um, because we need to be responsible and we need to take care of of our planet. Um, 
don't you think we kind of need to know, like, all acknowledge what the cause is so we can do that? Well, I we don't lo- know what to I'd love to. I, I'd love to see <laughs> all the climate change deniers acknowledge it, but that seems to be <laughs> a, a pointless argument. And 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 again, my point of view is whether whether or not they they believe it, you know still be responsible stewards of of our planet and uh you know let's not let companies pollute let's not um let our our uh, our our clean water and our our clean air be um uh, you know uh I, boy I, I had the word on the tip of my tongue but i don't want to just say polluted but um you know, debased or, or, or whatever. I, 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 I've lived in California about 15 years. And, um, you know, when I first got here, you, you could see the smog, uh, a lot. And, and these days you don't see it very often. Um, uh, certainly not like when I first moved here. So is that, you know, I, now I don't know exactly, uh, you know all the reasons that is but i have no doubt that a big part of it is you know california's um strong environmental standards and um and and uh, you know california has been leading the way on environment issues and i think they that we can we should continue to so um uh, you know that that's where where i am on the environment uh, okay. i i think they're you know, the idea that being uh, responsible stewards of our planet is somehow inconsistent with um, pro-business ideals, uh, I, I think that that's uh, outright false. A lot of people have been reporting on the extension of cap and trade in California. Um, the main opponents of cap and trade say exactly that, that it's an anti-business bill and everything along those lines. Um, Democrats who propose it are obviously in support of it. But then also, if you look outside of the United States, other countries are also implementing cap and trade, along with regulations mm-hmm. and carbon tax and mm-hmm. other things on top of it. China has implemented cap and trade. They wanted to do a carbon tax, but their businesses there actually influenced them to go a little further to the right Mm -hmm. and went with cap and trade instead. But several European countries have implemented some form of cap and trade. Other world leaders are actually praising California for making this move. And then you still hear a very, very divided debate here in the United States, do you do you have any comment on what that's about? Yeah, I, I mean it changed. So I, you know, the the points that, that I would make is um, we've had cap and change or cap and trade here mm-hmm. in California. This is this was an extension of that, right? And and so we've had that, and and um, you know we've had some of the, the the extra taxes that are part of it. And, and I know that, that those are also scheduled to increase um, in the future, but we've had that, uh, you know, California, you know, the Republicans in California like to talk about how high our taxes are and how that discourages business. And, and sure, to some extent that's true, but, you know, our economy uh, is, is still very strong. Um, you know, California in, uh, businesses innovate in ways that, um, a lot of uh, other states, uh, their their businesses and industries don't. So, yes, it's um, you know uh, you know that any time you have higher taxes, that you know eventually that may have some effect on your businesses. But the cost of doing business in California is is higher, in some regards because of taxes, in some regards because of of uh, you know real estate. Um, utilities, uh, labor costs, you know, all kinds of things. But still, we have plenty of strong businesses making plenty of money. Nobody's, you know, I, I, you know for the most part, um, very few businesses are picking up and, and leaving California. 
Yes, some are, but um, you know, uh, our economy is, is growing and, um, and, and so I, I look at cap and trade as something that has not been a, uh, a, a huge impediment to businesses. Uh, and if you want to go back, uh, I think it's the point you mentioned a lot um, back, you know, before cap and trade started and, uh, you know, it, when there was a debate, you know, that was cap and trade was proposed as a free market idea, you know, mm -hmm. some some to be responsible where where businesses can, you know, purchase uh, credits and, and sell credits for, for their emissions. So, you know, to, to see, um, you know, the, how uh, vitriolic some of the opposition uh, uh, on the right is to cap and trade, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a little funny in that regard because, uh, you know, that was the, the free market, the Republican, um, idea at one point was to, uh, you know, this was better than other, uh, uh, options. And, um, and, and, you know, so that's the, the, the first point I'll make. The second point is if you look at the actual vote, um, it wouldn't have passed without Republicans voting for it. So, um, I believe there were seven Republicans in, uh, the assembly eight. that eight that, um, that, uh, voted with the, the Democrats and uh, and and so to me it, it was a, a bipartisan um, you know uh, decision uh, to me it was something that shows if if the two sides work hard uh, to together that you can um, you know make positive uh, uh, legislation happen uh, now, obviously, not everybody's happy, but I, I think when the you know we don't have enough compromise, and uh, if if uh, if people compromise and both sides are unhappy, then then that's uh, probably the sign of of, uh, of uh, a good idea, uh, and, um, and and yeah, maybe that wasn't necessarily the case with cap and trade. But it was still an example of uh, bipartisan uh, legislation. On on the other side of that too, regardless of what the politicians themselves think about the issue, a poll was released saying that eighty one percent of American or not Americans, Californians, see global warming and climate change as a very very great danger to not only our health but also our economy with the mm -hmm. way that it's going to impact everything. Not only that, you look at the rest of the world, like I said, and they're overwhelmingly trying to curb climate change. And with President Trump wanting to pull us out of the Paris Climate Accord, and I know there's a, a great debate going on about that, but to me it's more of an ideological stance that him and his followers don't really see it as a problem. But then you look at California, 81% of people here in California think that it is a very big problem. And then I'm wondering exactly who the opponents of it in California are representing when 81% of Californians are, yeah. are on board with it. I, yeah, I mean, I, I would just uh, think that you know, my, my initial reaction without actually digging into which uh, uh, assembly members voted uh, against cap and trade, I, I know that my your, your assembly member, yeah, Melissa Melendez did, um, and, and, uh, and I actually hope to meet with her at some point, not about this particular issue, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I know a lot of voters I've talked to so far, um, she's very popular. And uh, and I'm and I'm interested in in talking to her and because uh, I, I it sounds like she does a, good, a really good job of representing um, a lot of her constituents. Maybe not on uh, on uh, you know environmental issues. If I, if that eighty one percent holds true to this area, which I don't know, but um, you I, know a lot. I of times, disagree with her on a lot, but I will say that she is 
very communicative mm -hmm. and she does meet with her constituents on a very regular basis and she she is open to discussion yeah i've actually spoken with her personally see and 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 and, and that's that's everything i support as as somebody um running for office and um you know it, again it goes back to the person instead of um ideology and and so yeah i i may not agree with her on certain issues if she's a good representative if she um you know has an open mind if she listens to her constituents meets with her constituents which unfortunately you know our our congressman doesn't do that um and you know that then that's fantastic i went to a uh uh kind of like a it wasn't really a town hall but it was more like a a conversation type meeting uh, the other day in menifee with uh, one of the city council me uh, members there mm -hmm. and and she was sitting down and and, and uh, there was 30 to 40 just uh, Menifee residents there and you know afterwards the first thing I went up to her and said I just said you know congratulations you know great job for doing something like this and, and she was very appreciative of that uh, comment and and I and again I think we we need to you know recognize when our elected officials are doing the right thing and and uh, are, are trying to be inclusive and, and I mean, you know, there are some out there in Congress, both both in the uh, House and the and the Senate. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I would want to try to put a number on that, um, but uh, I'm you know, sure someone has <laughs> right. And you know, but you know, to me, there's it's indefensible to not have town halls if you're either a, a senator or a congressperson, a congressman or woman. Um, be, because you are um, accountable to the voters, to your constituents, and if you don't want to, if you don't want to do that, I, I mean, you should find a different line of work. It's, I mean, that's part and parcel of of what democracy is supposed to be. So I, I have no tolerance. Um, or appreciation for anyone uh, doing uh, who doesn't do town halls and or only does telephone town halls. I think I think a telephone town hall can <laughs> can be good if if you're also doing you know face to face uh, meetings with your constituents and and town halls. But um, if that's all you're doing, it, it's definitely kind of a uh, a, a scripted uh, or um, not not. Uh, you know, completely open um, dialogue. So. Uh, so, was there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Um, no, I, I mean, I think we talked about a lot of um, a lot of the things. We spent a lot of time talking about healthcare, mm -hmm. and you know, my just my thoughts about uh, governance and the type of elected officials we need. Um, you, you know, some of those things are a little. A little more hypothetical and tough to, um, you know, make a case to uh, voters on. Uh, but I think a lot of people, uh, you know, feel it and think it. It's one of those things that if you didn't know that some of, uh, you know, like the the, the uh, back channel ways of, of uh, that our government works, the the secretive. Um, you know the runarounds to procedure. Uh, you, if you didn't know or, or hear that that happened, you, you would just kind of think, okay, well things are things are working, and I, I don't, you know, maybe I don't like this policy or that policy, but things are working the way they're supposed to. No, they're not. Right. Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a game. It's a staged thing, and and there's a few. Uh, people in Congress who will speak out and say that um, you know there's one Republican uh, guy I, I admire because he he is very much a true believer in that his, his name is Justin Amash he's in um, Michigan and and one of the things among the things that he's said um, but he regularly comes out and talk and, and 
criticizes these processes that are are uh, staged. But one of the things he's proposed is that the speaker should not be um, a partisan figure, that the speaker should represent both, um, you know, uh, Congress uh, men and women from both sides of the aisle. It should be a nonpartisan uh, type of a thing. And, and he's, you know, criticized Speaker Ryan for that. And, uh, and I, and, you know, so, uh, more power to him uh, you know people need to speak the truth and uh, speak for speak up for good ideas and um, you know regardless of what that's going to mean for yourself you know when you're serving the public serving the country you know that comes first and you're below there was actually one thing that sure meaning to bring up russia <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting tired of hearing about Russia myself, but so I figured yeah, right. but uh, I figured I would ask, what do you think happened in 2016, and do you think Russia actually had anything to do with it? Yeah, I, I don't know what happened. I mean, it seems pretty clear that they, they were involved in, in, to some extent, of trying to sabotage or, or affect our election. You know, and I don't doubt for a minute the, you know, what we've heard from our intelligence agencies that they were trying to uh, help President Trump uh, and, and not, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton. Um, and, and, you know, I also know that Russia has tried to meddle in past elections. It seems, it seems like from what I've heard, you know, it, the extent to which they did last year was, uh, was you know, at a new level. Um, you know, and, and that's a, a threat to our country, whether it's Russia or China or any country that is trying to meddle in our election. You know, we are, like it or not, and, and I, I like it, we are the, the gold standard in, in this world of what, you know, uh, free and fair elections should be. And e even though we still have areas we can improve on as, as far as, you know, not just it being about two parties um, and, and uh, but you know compared to everywhere else uh, you know we're definitely uh, at or above uh, you know any other democracy uh, in this uh, in the world so um, so I yeah I mean that I am very concerned about what happened I I, I want to see a, a full investigation uh, I want to see the results, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm completely against any sort of corruption uh, in, in our government, whether it's, uh, you know, somebody colluding with the Russians, which is possible, um, or whether it's, uh, you know, some of these allegations that were made against Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, I, anybody, you know, that's part of being a public servant. If you're you know, you, your actions are going to be, or should be, um, held up and examined and scrutinized. And you know that again, that goes. That's why I talk about integrity. If people are going to do the right thing and are going to withstand that kind of scrutiny, then they need to be acting with integrity all the time. Um, you know, that's one of the definitions of integrity. It's not. It's not about what you do when people are looking, it's what you do when people aren't looking. And um, so it's not, you know, not what you can get away with. It's, it's about doing what's right. Uh, so, you know, bring it on, investigate them. Anyone who's corrupt, uh, you know, uh, shine a light, charge them with crimes, prosecute them. And, you know, our, our democracy will be the better for it. So, I've been passing this question around. Let's assume for a moment that Russia did actively hack the DNC and they are the ones that got those emails. WikiLeaks then proceeded to publish all of those emails. Do you think that that's actually a problem? Uh, what? What part? The fact that the emails went public. Well, um, 
I, I yeah, I, I mean, it's the DNC is 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 a private entity. Um, you know, as I said, I, I'm all for transparency in government. I don't I don't believe private entities, whether it's um, you know the DNC or the RNC or private businesses or um, you know private citizens. You know, God forbid. You know, what what if somebody's hacking into you know our emails and I you know if we, if you have an expectation of privacy, your privacy should be um, should be, should matter. And um, so you know that that was that's politics. And and if people are, are saying. Um, you know that that the DNC was crooked, and you know then we should shine a light on it. Well, of course they're crooked. We know they're crooked. We know they were, you know, uh, we know they were trying to keep Bernie Sanders uh, from winning, and and the Republicans do the same thing, whether or not they're sending emails about it. Um, you know, but uh, again, any sort of uh, public business, public officials. And, and you know the, the, the DNC, even though they um, are, are related to public officials, uh, you know it's a private entity. So I, I would not say I, I, I see merit in hacking somebody hacking into a private entity and then um, you know invading their privacy in, in that regard. Um, I don't know. Did, did, that, did I answer the question yeah. or did I get off track? Okay. <laughs> it Everything involving that whole thing is a very big, complex, convoluted subject. Right. So it's it, kind of hard it's, to stay on topic with any response. Well, to and and I mean, I don't I don't talk about Russia or any of that. I, I don't send out tweets. I don't post on it. I, I don't even really talk about it. You know, because it is so convoluted, and it is, and and people want to argue over every little thing you know um i i mean i i tend to believe the worst about everybody so uh, you know i i'm i'm expecting <laughs> somebody to be guilty of something you know i don't know who it's going to be i don't know what it is but um you know we'll, we'll find out in time and you know let let the let the invest investigations go on let, let's get truth let's get light and uh, and then go from there, and, and uh, you know I, I I'm in no rush to prejudge anything. I'd rather have the truth and and uh, have everybody uh, make the right decision than uh, speculate and uh, and uh, you know convict people ahead of time. That's probably the best answer I've heard on Russia. <laughs> <laughs>